let's go ahead and get started so we can uh, get as much as we can out of uh, Acts chapter 2. That's where we're at. And we're, we're going to begin with um, uh, the first verse here shortly. And we're only going to go probably down to the uh, 13th verse. I'll mention uh, a few verses past that. Uh, and then um, Ted will come and take the 13 and the rest of the chapter when he gets back. He's, he's marrying one of his, uh, I believe, a former parishioner uh, in Arkansas or somewhere like that. So uh, we retire and we still have to do a lot of stuff. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we thank you for your love, your patience with all of us. Help us to be exactly what you want us to be this morning. Get us out of the way so your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts through your word. And uh, we just lift this class up to you. We ask that you bless their lives. You know what their needs are. You know what their requests are. And we ask that you meet in a tangible way and grant those needs and grant those requests. We ask this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Okay. Uh, so if you'll turn uh, to Acts chapter 2, I am uh, much of the passages of, of this passage that I'm going to read, I'm going to read out of the Amplified Bible. Uh, I don't know if you have a copy of that, but if you do, that's a beautiful uh, way to read the scripture, and it's a great, uh, and I'm a walker, I'm sorry, but it's a good, um, uh, just sit down and read. Uh, it, back when I was a kid and I was first saved, we had the living New Testament, actually. You didn't even have the whole living Bible then, and that came into play later. But uh, I, I enjoyed uh, J.B. Phillips' translation of the New Testament. He passed away before he could uh, start work on the Old Testament, but I love that one as well. But when I preach, I preach out of this Bible, and it's my... Uh, uh, New King James, so it helps folks who, who follow along in King James to, to stay as close as I can. But uh, don't, don't slam me if you, if you lose track, just bear with me. You can't see it anyway, so um, <laughs> hang in there. I may have to get up on this other side. This is pretty tall. Thank you, brother. All right. Um, so I'm kind of short, so just bear with me. All right, uh, so Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And keep in mind that in, in verse, our first chapter that we've already covered, that this group of people have been told by Christ even before he told his disciples in John uh, at, the, at the Last Supper, to, I want you to stay here and watch, and we'll get into that just a little bit in depth, but they're hanging out in Jerusalem. And the resurrection has occurred, uh, the ascension has occurred, and they are following what Christ told them to do. Not only that, but in Joel as well. But uh, a number of other places where they were told to watch and wait for the Holy Spirit, the, the uh, dissension or the, uh, the, the uh, indwelling or infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, don't be afraid of Pentecost. I, Baptists are, are, you know, we, the Pentecostals went one way and we went the other. I'm, I'm sorry, but I've been doing this for 40 some years and it's the same way. I left my water out in the car, Dad, come in. I take a medication, it drives me out, but I do have a, I'll get a lozenge from her if I need one. But we not need to be afraid of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, let me go ahead and start and then we'll get into that. When the day of Pentecost had come, they all were all together in one place. And I want to share with you, if you, if you want to, turn to John chapter 14, 15, and 16, because we're going to look at that as well. And keep in mind that, that when Jesus told them to hang into the uh, upper room and, and to tarry in Jerusalem, thank you, brother, um, that uh, that was a command. And if you remember, there are about 120 of them, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Now, 
Keep in mind, Jesus had preached for three years and gone around the disciples and miracles and all kinds of stuff. They're gathered in Jerusalem, and that's why they had the Passover, uh, or the Last Supper, if you will. They observed the Passover. Uh, and then Jesus went on through the trials and, and crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. Luke's already laid all that out. He's already laid out the gospel. And that was the incarnation, the life of Christ, the, the uh, death, sacrificial death that he, he provided for you and I. He was our propitiation. He, was, he took our place on the cross. To, uh, our punishment was put on him so that you and I wouldn't have to experience the punishment of sin anymore. Now, when Jesus came, if you will, there's a progressive revelation of God. Why did God create us in the first place? Anybody? Real quick. Why did he create us? Come on, you know the answer. For fellowship, right? Who did he walk with? Hello. You almost got shot. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm kidding. But why did God create us? He created us to have fellowship with him. What did Adam and Eve do in the garden? They did what? Walked with God. They communicated with God. They had fellowship with God. Face to face in the garden. Until when? Until sin separated them. Until sin came into their life and God kicked them out of the garden and said, you're going to tarry from now on and you messed up the best thing and why I created you in the first place. Now, I didn't create you as a robot. I didn't create you as a puppeteer or a puppet and me be the puppeteer. I wanted to have fellowship with you. Well, when that revelation got spoiled, if you will, and revelation of God himself, of himself to you and I. Now, after the garden, after we were kicked out, or they were kicked out, then we had all these other systems, and all these other rules, and all these other feasts, and all these other sacrifices, and all these other systems to try to bring people back to fellowship with God. That's his desire for us. And if you'll look at the Old Testament, when did the Holy Spirit appear? When did the Holy Spirit work in the Old Testament? How did that happen? Well, you got the burning bush, right? God in, in the bush. You've got each prophet who God filled. He wasn't using them as a puppet. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. That's not how God works. He used them, through them, indwelt them to do His work to edify, to magnify, to accomplish God's work, right? And that was done on a one-on-one-on-one-on-one-on-one -on -one -on -one -on -one basis, right? When you read the Old Testament. So that's how God kept trying to pull His creation back to Him and also to allow His creation, us, them, to have fellowship with Him, a relationship with Him, and it had to come through many different ways. And as it progressed, as it developed, and then you came into the sacrificial system and the temple and then the priests and all that stuff, God was constantly trying to get us back in fellowship and relationship with himself. That's his desire for you and I. Now, why? Because that's why we were created. The second progressive piece of God's revelation was what? When Jesus came and was foretold by John the Baptist, who, by the way, the Holy Spirit of God was on him and filled him even where? In his mother's womb. Right? From the beginning. Then he was uh, uh, Elizabeth, and all the... Uh, we'll get into that in just a second. But the progressive revelation of God, and he came on this earth in flesh through Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, and now God the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus had to come through the prophecies. Everything was prophesied. You go into Isaiah and all the other prophets that foretold of the Messianic, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the One who came to take our place and to eradicate sin in our life, to be our King and to be our Lord, our Controller. The Holy Spirit of God worked through the Lord Jesus Christ in person. God in person was Christ. So God in flesh revealed himself to mankind. 
For what reason? To show them he's real. And to show them he loved them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. And then Jesus comes on the scene, lives for 33 years, teaches his, his last uh, three years in ministry and de demonstrating miracles and demonstrating his, his messianic presence and why he came for us. What his job was to, as Jesus to show us how to have fellowship, how to have a relationship with God right now, right here. Okay? Now, as God became flesh, his second progressive revelation of himself, to do what? To draw us back to him. For us to have fellowship with him. Number one, to have a relationship with him. And through Jesus' blood, we become a blood relative of God when we accept his gift, right? But what did Jesus do in John chapter 14 and 15 and 16 as they're in the Passover supper? He's preparing them for his departure, for his death, for his burial, his resurrection, his punishment. He's getting them, if you will, pre-counseling and grief, <laughs> He's telling them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, look at verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Now there's a lot of talk and a lot of things about whether or not the Holy Spirit, or these people were in the upper room. There's a, keep in mind, about 120 of them. Pretty good sized room, Right? And when we see the pictures of Michelangelo, they're just sitting around a table. It really don't look like it's going to hold 120 people. Now, whether it's there or a different place, who cares? And keep in mind, this is um, Pentecost is Easter plus 49 days. Okay? The 50th day is when Pentecost, Penta meaning 50, and the Holy Spirit was going to come down. He told them to tarry and wait. Now, you think they just stayed in that room the whole time? Or did they, as it says, devout Jews here in just a minute, they went to the temple every day. They went and taught. They hadn't stopped. They didn't cease. Now, did they look upward? Did they look for the, uh, the... They didn't know where the Pentecost or the Holy Spirit was going to come out. They had no clue. But they tarried, they prayed, they watched, and they were waiting for the Pentecost. Now, in John chapter 16, verse 7, the scripture says, But verily, tr uh, very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, the helper, the uh, Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, he's fulfilling what Joel, and you'll see that in the latter part of or the uh, verses 16, 17, and following down to 21 in Acts chapter 2, where, where uh, Luke quotes, and I quote uh, verse 16, but this is the beginning, the beginning of what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And he says in verse 17, and it came to, it shall be, um, it shall be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind. All mankind. Not just the prophets, not just those individuals I've selected to lead, guide, direct, and, and, and preach against your sin, but give you the promises upon all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. The young men shall see divinely prom uh, uh, prom uh, uh, prompted visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, divinely prompted dreams, even on my bondservants, both men and women. I will in those days pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will bring wonders in the skies above, and signs attesting miracles. That's what he's talking about. That's why we had miracles. That's why Jesus performed signs, to attest of divinity. And his divinity. Um, 
I will in those days pour out my spirit and shall, they shall prophesy. I will bring about wonders in the skies, all of those things on the earth, below, uh, below blood and fire and smoke and uh, vapor, smoke vapor. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Before I end it, before I say that's it, before I tell you nobody else, we're done. And the trump shall sound and the Lord will come and descend and it's over. Now before the day of the Lord comes, this pouring out of the Holy Spirit on all mankind is going to occur. Now, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit when you go back to John chapter 14 and look at 15 and 16 and so on. If, now, the word if in the Bible, that's one of the biggest words in the Scripture. Now, it can be of the same or different, but when you see the word if, look for the flip side of what he's stating. If you love me, you'll do what? Keep my commandments. If you don't love me, that's the flip side. It's unspoken. You ain't going to keep my commandments. So what I'm telling you, when you read the word if, and it's chalked throughout the Bible, if you'll do it, if you confess your sins with your mouth, what will I do? I will, if you confess your sins with your mouth, I will forgive you of your sins, plural, small. John's writing to the church, <laughs> Christians, in that passage. He uses little s. Not the sin of unforgiveness, that's dealt with through the acceptance of Christ, and that's what actually the sin that sends us to hell, that's the unpardonable sin, is not receiving God's gift. But after we receive God's gift, we're still human beings. We are not robots. We are not puppets. We are not made to do and walk like Christ. We choose to. And when we choose not to, that's sin. When we disobey God, that's what sin is, disobedience to God. Okay? So, he says here, if you love me, if, keep my commandments. And I will ask of the Father, and he will give to you another, what? Helper. Advocate. To help you. This helper, uh, to help you, and will be with you just for a short period of time? Just when he feels like it? No. Forever. He says that the Holy Spirit the advocate, and then verse 17, the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. We're going to see that in this passage here in just a minute. But you know him for what? He lives with you and will be in you. But in verse 26, he says it again. He's telling his disciples at the, at the Last Supper. But... The advocate, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Now, when you go to Genesis, when was Jesus around? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In Genesis, he said, we create men in our image. He's always been that. He's been a, 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 in the Trinity his forms or his, his beings of himself are designed for one thing, to bring us back to him. Now, he's promising the Holy Spirit. This paraclete, the word for spirit is paraclete, and it is not translated as, is, is not the bystander. It's not the bystander who sits out there and watches us like in a ball game. We, he's, not, he's not a bystander. But he's the one who is called to stand alongside of us. The Holy Spirit of God is the stand buyer, not the bystander. So when the Holy Spirit has come at this point and offered to mankind and, dis, and demonstrated to all those who were there, like the, uh, the prophets, he dealt with them one on one, now, the Holy Spirit, because Christ has paid the penalty for our sin, 
He's fulfilling the prophecies of Joel, and he's telling them that the stand buyer will be here and available to all of you. In a way you can't hardly imagine. And they couldn't. They couldn't. This celebration of the Feast of Weeks after the, after the Pentecost and the four Sabbaths, if you will, is designed, it was in, in our Christian um, uh, thought and our Christian world, it commemorates the descent of God's Holy Spirit on the apostles and the other disciples. Following the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ, the Acts of the Apostles here, here in chapter 2, and it marks the true turning point of the beginning of the Christian church's mission to the world. Now, do you see how important the Holy Spirit of God descending and coming upon us and upon them at Pentecost kicked off the first church? the beginning of our mission. He's saying, look, I have walked with you in the garden. Through the ages, I have provided all kinds of menstruations, all kinds of, of forms, all kinds of sacrifices to get your heart right with me so that I can have fellowship with you. I came in the form of my son to walk with you and talk with you. At age 12, I taught in, this, in, the, in the temple. And who was amazed? All those that were listening at 12 years old, at his spiritual maturity. I walked, I talked, I bled, I was beaten, I was innocent but I did it. Why? Because I love you. And I want you to love me. Every drop of blood from Jesus' brow, his side, his hands, his feet, his back, every drop of blood screamed, I love you. I love you. I love you. Now, <clears throat> God the Father, he walked with Adam and Eve, as we said. God the Son came to provide the good news. As Luke laid out in his gospel just before Acts, as we have it in our Bible, and the birth, life, sacrificial death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and now we have God, the Holy Spirit, the abiding presence of every believer, the comforter, the one who intercedes, who advocates for us, the very presence of God in your life and in mine. Personal. One-on-one. -on -one. Just like he did with the prophets, Moses, and all those other followers of God where God laid his... His, his hand or his, his I'm going to use you and I'm going to fill you and people are going to not like you. <laughs> Most of the prophets were not liked. You know that, right? Most of them were kind of hated because they confronted people's sin. And when you confront people's sin, that makes them angry. That makes them act strange. That makes them not like us. They don't like us because we do that. But that doesn't lessen the amount of presence God had in all those people's lives. Now, now, he's making himself available to every single one of us who are believers, who accept the gospel of Christ, invite him into our hearts, and accept him. Now, when you read John chapter 15, when you... If you haven't read this in a long time, go back and read John 14, 15, 16, and uh, even into 17. In John 15 alone, 
Ten times John uses the word abide. I will abide with you. I'm going to fill you. I'm going to possess the part of you that I made for myself in every human being. And that's our spirit. Okay? That's where the temple is, is our spirit. This old crummy body, it's, it's corruptible. But when we ask Christ to come into our heart, and Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door. The door of what? You and me. Our heart's door. And knock. And if, <laughs> the biggest word in the Bible, if you open the door, I will come in to you. And what else does he say? I will sup with you. I will have fellowship with you. He doesn't say anything about leaving. In fact, in Romans 8, he says, Who can pluck you, who can pluck you out of my love? Who can pluck you out of my hand? Nothing separates you from the love of God. And he goes into a long list there. And what he doesn't put in there, and it's implied, is us too. Angels and principalities and powers. And who are we to pluck our own selves out of God's hands? And I, I, I know in the, in the day it was always, if saved, always saved. I never really held to that. I use the same biblical word. If saved, always saved. Can't ungrind, ungrind cornmeal, can you? No, but you can take it and make something else out of it. Fried okra, jalapeno cornbread. Mm, good stuff. Put it on the bottom of a pizza, keep it from sticking. Mm. Put it on squash and fry it up. Y'all getting hungry? Mm. So Luke has already told us about the gospel. Now the Holy Spirit, his abiding presence of each and every believer to comfort them, intercede, advocate, and God's presence in our lives. Ten times in John 15, he talks about abiding. Now, before the Pentecost in Luke, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. The Holy Spirit was, came upon Mary and the power of the Most High overshadowed her. Elizabeth and Zechariah were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was upon uh, Simeon and he saw in Jesus, God's salvation for all people. That's what he saw in Jesus. And he stated that. Now, don't be afraid of Pentecost. And I can't even say a clock. Okay, what time do we have to be out of here? 10.25? Or 10.20? Is that right? Anyway, we'll get there. But don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. As a Christian, when we accept Christ, we open that door to our heart and Christ comes in, how does He do that? The, Jesus is where? The right hand of the Father, back in heaven. Now, the revelation of God has come and God the Holy Spirit is in our hearts and living in us, demonstrating His love to us, filling us with His presence, filling us with what? The fruits of the Holy Spirit. You want proof that you're saved? You want to put to rest whether or not you're going to heaven if you died right now? Do you have the fruits of the Holy Spirit in your life? It's not the gifts. We'll get into those in just a minute. The fruits of the Holy Spirit are what? What's the first one? Come on. Love. And peace. And patience. And kindness. And gentleness. Now, how many of us have been impatient? How many of us have not had peace? <laughs> How many of us have not had real love for somebody? Yeah. There's two people in this world, or was, they're both dead now, that I literally wanted to kill with my bare hands. No, I'm not kidding. The first one was the guy who doused my wife's oldest sister, my sister-in-law, with gasoline, her and her six-year-old daughter. Three weeks before the Oklahoma City bombing. And doused them, set them on fire, we buried her sister the day before the bombing, and then the bombing happened the next day. So I've got a niece suffering in the hospital. My uh, Jan's sister was suffering for three weeks or so and died the Friday before the bombing, and we buried her on Tuesday, wasn't it? Yeah, Tuesday. So that guy 
who set them on fire as I watched in children's hospital where my niece was one day. They had gone down and put a trach in her, in her uh, a tracheotomy in. They brought her back up to the children's ICU and put her on one of these air mattresses, you know, that shoot things at you to keep you from getting bed sores. It deflated and it folded up on her a little bit and yanked out the tube the doc, the surgeon, had just put in. And I'm standing at the foot of her bed with one of my firefighters, and she codes. The doctor come running up there in his scrubs, yelling and screaming, not being real nice to the nurses. What did you guys do? So he reinserts the, the trach. They're bagging her as best they can. And he fixes it, and me and my firefighter are standing at the, at the foot of the bed near the doors. And finally, one of the nurses looked back and said, y'all need to leave. So we just walked outside by the desk. And I watched her die. They brought her back. She's 30 years old and got a 9-year-old daughter, granddaughter of mine. We, we adopted her. She's my daughter now. Still hard-headed. About like that. Still hard-headed, just like her mama was, just like her daddy was. And I wanted nothing more than to get a hold of that guy. And I wanted to burn him from his toes all the way up to his head as much as I could. And I wanted to kill him with my bare hands. I was angry. Then the bombing happened. <laughs> that just intensified my anger didn't give me a chance to regroup as a Christian. And I ended up having to forgive that guy. We went through the trial. He was on death row. I had a soldier who was a, was a death row guard in, at McAllister. And I would send in my hatefulness, in my lack of love, my lack of walking with God, I'd send messages to this guy on death row through my prison guard. And I'd say, hey, we're doing our 20th surgery with uh, Tress and my daughter. You ain't suffering one bit. Not like she is. We went to Shriners, I don't know how many times. Tens and tens of times to have pieces fixed. But I hated it. Then the bombing happens. And my number two guy blew up the Murrah building. My bank was in the Murrah building. I used to take my kids down there and go banking. We'd park just up from where that truck was parked, the rider. Or we'd park in the garage and walk through and, and go up the stairs and go to the credit union. I used to jack with all the tellers and turn their names upside down and wad paper up as they turned around to, you know, do my banking, I'd hit them with a big old paper wad. I'd steal their ink pens and eat their candy. My first loan that we got back uh, when we moved back to Oklahoma was there. And with the loan officer whose office was no longer there. So it happened, we go inside and start working the bombing and all that was left of my bank once I got up there was about a 20 by 20 square foot piece of concrete. And a little old lady stuck and was found by one of my firefighter chiefs who stepped on her head because he, he didn't see her. And they began to uncover her. And then I went upstairs, and went over to her, began to work. And we got her out. And then she died a few years ago. Nancy Ingram was her name. And I wanted nothing more. In fact, most of us who worked the Oklahoma City bombing wanted nothing more than them to bring him down and turn him loose on sight. And if he could have gotten away, let him get away. But that was not going to happen. And I hated him. I hated him. I wanted to kill him all the things that I had done and seen and all my firefighters and police officers and construction workers, all of us wanted him dead. 
until the Holy Spirit of God, the indwelling presence of the Lord, convicted me, said, dummy. Well, I felt like he said, dummy. That ain't right. And you're not walking with me because of your hatred. Because you can't forgive these guys. And I had to forgive them. Oh, at first it was kind of lip service until the Holy Spirit of God, the presence of the God our Father, God the Holy Spirit, got a hold of me and said, this ain't forgiveness. You know how you know when you forgive somebody? They're not in your dreams anymore. They're not permeating your thoughts anymore. And you can go on down the road and not give them a second thought. And you take what they took away from you and you replace it with victory. And you're able to demonstrate what? Love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's our proof that the Holy Spirit of God lives in our hearts, lives in our lives. He's there. That's how you know. You want to know if you're walking with God? That's the list. And it's not just one of them. It's all or none. It's kind of hard to demonstrate love, forbearance, and self-control when you hate somebody. And that's called grieving the Holy Spirit for us Christians. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, nor quench it. Don't cut Him off in your life to where He has to say, i got to remove you. And He did that in Acts. We'll get into those later. People who lied to the Holy Spirit. You know who I'm talking about. If not, we'll get to it later. Then you have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are tools that the Holy Spirit uses to do what? To help us fulfill His work, His ministry in this world. Prophecy, service, teaching, evangelism, giving, leadership, mercy, healing, wisdom. Faith, understanding, counsel, fortitude, discernment, and tongues is mentioned. What are they used for? To edify the work, the tools that we use to do God's work. And I'm just going to throw this out there. The tongues that he's talking about, those things in in, in, uh, Galatians, he says they had them. Now, in this passage, when he gets into it, he's talking about language. Known dialects. You know, where you've got Greek and then you've got sub-dialects in Greek. And everybody heard in their own language and their own dialect. Known languages. Not the unknown. Now, I'll say this about God giving us languages in the midst of our work and edifying Him and His work. I went on a mission one time for, uh, it's called a medical readiness mission. We went to Costa Rica and uh, flew in on a C-130 and, and it stayed in one of the nastiest armor or, or barracks that I've ever stayed in. Worse than anything, the old World War II stuff. I mean, tents were better than this joint. And um, anyway, we went up into the northern part of Costa Rica and, and went to village after village and we helped people. And we'd come back to our base camp. And our guard, they didn't have police, they have guards, they have military. He's sitting there with a fail, which is a 7.62 automatic rifle, on the bus outside our compound guarding us all night long. And we had guards all, all the day. We were real close to Nicaragua. In fact, most of the people we took care of were Nicaraguan Contras. They lived in Costa Rica, 
so that Nicaragua couldn't come into Costa Rica and get them. But they'd go north and, and do their biz, business in Nicaragua. And we were taking care of them and their families, basically, is what, what we were doing. And this guard and I were sitting in a bus one night, and he's, he was there all night long. And I went out there one night, and I, I sat down with him. I had my cross on my uniform, and um, we got to talking. Didn't speak a, hardly any Spanish. In fact, when I got saved, I lost half my vocabulary because most of those were Spanish cuss words. And I knew all those, but, you know, buenos dias, I didn't know much of that. I, or communication uh, Spanish. He didn't know any English. And we're sitting there on this bus talking. So I'm sitting there, and God gave me words that I had had in my Spanish class that I hadn't remembered in many, many years. And I'm pulling them out and throwing them out, and, and, and I used sign language like Jesus, Christ, Christos, uh, to explain to him why I was there and why I was wearing a cross and that I was a padre to him. He thought I was a priest. And I'm trying to communicate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with this guy. Because I know he's Catholic and I know he's probably never accepted Christ except through the communion. And when you ask a Catholic about accepting Christ, oh, would they, would they do it every Sunday? Through the host through the sacraments, the dispensation of grace to them. They do it every Sunday. And it's required for them to maintain their membership or their salvation. So I'm talking to him, and three hours, it took me three hours to get him to pray and to accept in his heart the Lord Christos, and he did. And he prayed with me in his language. I didn't understand it. But I tried my best to communicate to him. So I go to bed and I get up and I get my Catholic uh, translator, uh, one of our nurses, and uh, she's Catholic, but she was my tr one of my translators. Took her back to him before he got off duty. And I said, would you explain to him what I meant last night. I want to see if he understood me completely. So I go through the gospel again. Now she's translating in Spanish for me. And he says, oh yeah, yeah. I accepted Christ last night. I don't have a problem with that. Do you? I don't have a problem with it. Now, Let's go on and let's try to finish this. We've got 10 minutes. The unbelievers and the believers have talents, but only the Holy Spirit energizes those talents of the believer for the purposes of edifying his work. And then verse 2, And suddenly a sound came from heaven like a rushing violent wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Have you ever got up in the morning, gone outside in the middle of a field or on the lake and watched the sun break through at daybreak? And you feel the, the wind begin to change, the trees begin to rustle if it's a calm day or a calm night. And as the sun heats up the air, it begins to rush toward you. Have you ever done that? If not, you need to do that. This morning was a bust. But on a beautiful day, get up and go do that. Now, they were flabbergasted. They were beside themselves when they heard this sound or this rushing wind that they felt. And then they, what's it say? Uh, it filled the house where they were sitting, if you will, like daybreak in a, in a beautiful, marvelous way. But it scared them. There appeared on them, on, uh, to them, or the scripture says on them, tongues resembling fire, which were being distributed among them, and they rested on each one of them as each person received the Holy Spirit. And they were filled, all filled. That is, they, they, uh, the Holy Spirit diffused throughout their being with the, with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. 
uh, and that's the Greek word for it, for him, and began to speak in other tongues, different languages. As the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out clearly, appropriately. The Holy Spirit has never worked mechanically. Like I said, we are not controlled by a puppeteer. We are not puppets. That's not how God works. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. The audible visual signs were a passing phenomenon, but the presence and the power of God of the Holy Spirit was permanent and important reality of Pentecost. Remains today. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, if you're a Christian, did a big, mighty, rushing wind hit you? I was at Falls Creek. I didn't know the difference between salvation and rededication and, and surrendering special service. I was dumber than a box of rocks. All I know is my youth director turned around to me and said, Ted, do you want to become a Christian? I knew three Christians in my life at that time. My girlfriend who made me go to Falls Creek, dated her for two years, two years later, she made me go. My English teacher, who's a retired missionary now, Sharon Everhart, love her to death. She was my ninth grade English teacher. And then she went on to the mission field, her and Jack. And then my best friend named Benny Aubrey was a walking, talking, godly man. Almost broke his neck in wrestling. In fact, I put him in the hospital for, for a week or two because I almost broke his neck. Benny Aubrey, three. They weren't Mamby pamby goody two shoes. They were godly people. And they were Christians. Now they all three told me that. So when my youth director turned around, and by the way, he became the youth pastor at Nichols Hills Baptist Church back in the day. Y'all stole him from me when I was a kid. Those three people. And when my youth director, if he'd have said, Ted, you want to give your heart to the Lord? I wouldn't have known what he was talking about. Ted, do you want to become a godly person? I wouldn't have known what he was talking about. Ted, do you want to be saved? I wouldn't have known what he was talking about. Ted, do you want to become a Christian? The only reference, the only frame of reference I had was those three people. One of them was sitting right next to me at Falls Creek. About pulled him over the pew. Go down front, end up in the rededication place, and this teenage boy comes up to me and says, so, you're here to rededicate your life? And I said, I guess. He said, well, when did you give your heart to the Lord? I said, what's that? He said, ooh, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> Scared him to death. He picked me up, took me over to salvation. I fortunately got with an old missionary and a godly man who sat down and, and right through the scripture, the Roman road, and helped me become a Christian at that moment. That's when the Holy Spirit came in my life. I was filled with hate. I hated my mother. My dad and mom had gotten a divorce the year before, and I hated her. What another person I hated? I didn't see her for a year. Blamed her for the divorce. And God replaced all that anger and hate and all that violence in my life uh, up to that point and had two brothers who hung me in the backyard one time, literally, and it kicked the bucket. They just didn't tie my hands. I swung over to the tree after they left the backyard, was able to unloose the rope, got down, and Mama beat that snot out of them. I was not raised in a Christian home. But God laid a claim on my heart and my life that day. He came into me. My advocate came. He showed me what I was supposed to do. From that point on, His impact on my intro, interrelated uh, facilities of my mind, my emotions, and my will was permanent. He entered my spirit and my soul came alive and was permeated by the spirit from within. And I started thinking, I started emoting, I started choosing God over all the other stuff that was in my life. Our soul is made up of our mind, emotions, and our will, by the way. I mean, you got to have a thought before you can have an emotion. You gotta, and then based on those two, you have an action. Right? Forrest, you're pretty 
relax right now, but you think if I come over there and slap snot out of you, you're going to have a thought coupled with an emotion and then some kind of reaction, make a choice off of that? It can happen that fast. That's why trauma is so uh, 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 devastating in our lives. We have thoughts, emotions, and our will all in, in quick successions many, many times. But the Holy Spirit comes and has has uh, uh, the advocate that was promised by Christ entered the believer's community to guide us and to protect us until the second coming. Apart from being a very beautiful feast that that was happening, because at the end of Pentecost, they had uh, the 50 days, they had the feast uh, that celebrated the end of the harvest. And, uh, but the celebration of God's hand guiding the Christian community through all of our trials and decisions that are presented to us even today. That's his work. The Holy Spirit is an advocate. John 15, 26 says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, and he will testify about me, and also you must testify about me just as they did on the day of Pentecost when Christ comes into your heart he expects you and I to fulfill that promise now I didn't get finished with most of this but every one of them heard in their own dialect from Jews from all over the world proselytes Jewish Christians who were godly people said, wow, I'm hearing my own language by these who have been touched, who have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And I understand. And just like any other group of people, they were the naysayers. They were the ones who said they were drunk with wine. And then Peter begins his, his sermon in the uh, 14th verse. The Holy Spirit of God is not to be feared, but to be embraced. Why? Because that's God in us. And when we quench or grieve that Spirit of God, we're quenching His work through us. And we have to stop. And we have to apply John, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us and then do what? Cleanse us and wash us from our iniquity. Big if. Don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Don't get caught up in the goofy arguments. I had a Pentecostal kid that tried to tell me I had to have the second blessing of the Holy Spirit. I said, what are you talking about? Dude, when I said Jesus is coming to my heart, how do you think he came in? And change me. You knew me before. I was a punk. I was a thug. And Christ came into me and changed me. I didn't get a second place. I got all of him I wanted right then and there. I just had to allow him to start whittling away at my stupidity and my sin and my, all my thinking. Changed my thinking, which changed my emotions, which changed my will. And I've been doing it for 40 plus years since I was 14. More than that now. I'll be 64. Kiss a pig. 50 some years. Don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Seek to embrace Him. Seek to allow Him to love through you, to work through you, to apply your tools, your gifts and to demonstrate to you the fruits that he has to bear in us. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your love, your patience with us. We thank you for all that you've done for us. God, as you indwell us, help us to honor you with our lives. Help us to be exactly what you want us to be. Cleanse us. Wash us. Work through us. Love through us. Replace the things that are 
evil in our lives and the sin with your goodness and graciousness. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.